Today is the second of Muharram and so on this day in the year 61 Hijri is when Imam Hussein salam, along with his companions arrived in Karbala. And when they arrived there, you know, he asked someone passing by, what is this place? He knew, but he wanted to make sure everybody else knew. He said, he said, what is this place? And the person told him Karbala, and he told his people, he said, we will pitch our tents here. Because this is where we have to stop. Uh, everything he did, he did with knowledge. Uh, there's nothing that he did that he didn't know what he was doing and what the outcome of what he was doing would be. And yet he still took these steps so that Islam would become alive again. Uh, there's a poem where the poet, he says that after every, every Karbala, Islam gains life. You know, Karbala didn't stop with Imam Hussain al-Islam, but this is his miracle that Karbala keeps going on. You, know, you have Karbala after Karbala after Karbala. But the purity of the original Karbala is something different though. And we'll go over that as well, inshallah. But getting back to what we've been talking about, which is the background. What led up to a situation where you could have this happen? You know, where you could have the grandson of the messenger, Rasulullah being massacred, along with his companions, and the women of the household of Rasulullah being taken prisoners. So last week we had gotten to where we were talking about the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu. So Abu Bakr radiallahu of course is Khalifa for a little over two years. Umar radiallahu is Khalifa for ten years roughly. And during the Khilafah of these two, who are known as Shaykhain, you know, any time in reality nothing was allowed to stick its head up that was wrong. You know, you had the six, first six months of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr then where you had the Rida Wars of, you know, dealing with all of those who apostated. But every time the hypocrites would try to, to stick their head out and do something, <coughs> you know, they would knock it down before they had a chance. And this was the foresightedness <coughs> of these companions. <coughs> After Umar, of course, Uthman becomes the Khalifa. And Uthman Radio is Khalifa for 12 years. And the first six years are very smooth. The same thing. Because you have basically the same people dealing with everything. Again, anytime anything tries to stick his head up, it's knocked down. You know, anything wrong that comes up, dealt with immediately before, you know, any further issues can arise from it. And for the first six years, Ali Radion is Chief Justice, as he was during the Khilafah of Omar Radion and effectively during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr Radion. After six years, he removes himself from that position. And we'll go and you know, we'll understand some of the reasoning behind all of this later, inshallah. Here again, it's important to understand how to bias ourselves when we're looking at this history. Because again, history is always biased. You know, 
one way or the other, or multiple ways, you know, because of the background of the person looking at it. The other thing, important thing to understand here is that when we are looking at history from this point, 1400 years later, uh, the perspective has changed, you know, because our farsightedness is not like it used to be. With, you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu said, you know, fear the sight of a mu'min because he sees through the nur of Allah. We have lost that. So now when we start looking at it, and even later people when we were looking at all of this, these things that were happening, and some of the people that were there looking at these things that were happening, who had no understanding of what was going on, you know, they start laying blame on this person or that person, uh, when that person should not be blamed. When we look at the character of Uthman, you know, if I look at the character of anyone, you know, I need to look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger said. You know, if Allah and His Messenger say something about somebody, then who are we to dispute with that? And if we dispute with that, then we have left Islam. Uthman, of course, is one of the early Muslims. He accepted Islam during the period of secret propagation. Rasulullah gave him his daughter Ruqayya to be married. So he is the husband of the second daughter of Rasulullah Bibi Ruqayya. And when she passed away, as the Muslims were coming back from Badr, Rasulullah now gave him his third daughter, Umm Kulthum as a wife. And when she passed away, he said, he's, he made a statement that if I had any other daughters, I would marry them off to Uthman one by one. Of course, Bibi Fatima is an exception to this and she falls into a different category altogether, but that's a different issue we'll talk about later in Shalom. And because of this, because he married two of the daughters of Rasulullah so some one after the other, his, his title became known as Dhul Nurin, meaning the, hope, the keeper of two lights. Which is also interesting for those who want to argue that Rasulullah so some is not Nur. Well, if his daughters are Nur, then how is he not Nur? When the, battle, when the time came for the battle of Tabuk, this was going to be a battle against a superpower of the time, against the Romans. But Rasulullah asked all of the companions, give whatever you can. And they all came, and of course, again, these are hard times for the Muslims, so they gave what they could, which was not much. Abu Bakr, Radio, who gave 100%, you know, everything he, could, he had in his house, including, you know, the the, uh, the the broom, and not just the broom, but the but the uh, I guess the uh, you know the brooms that time were hey you know you took grass old grass and you tied it together and that was the broom. So even you know the parts of the the broom that broke off, he picked those up as well. He took his own shirt off and put it in the pile, and put on a jute cloth that he tied together with thorns. And he goes and he presents to Rasulullah but this was everything he had, but all he had he could carry in his arms. And this is when, of course, when Rasulullah asked, what have you brought and what have you left for your family? He says, Ya Rasul, I have brought everything and I have left Allah and His Messenger for my family. <laughs> but when Rasulullah asked again, you know, is there anyone who can give? Uthman, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I, I, I will give a hundred camels that are loaded with provisions. And then he turned to the other side and he says, is there anyone else who can give more or give, give something? So Uthman, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I will give 200 camels with all provisions. And again, Rasulullah addressing the companions, he says, is there anyone who can give more, give anything? 
He said, Ya Rasulullah says, I'll give 300 camels with all of their provisions. And then Rasulullah says, tells him, he says, go and bring them. And he told the companions, the reason I didn't ask for more was he would give more. And he would have given everything. But I did not want to put him in that situation or that condition. And so what he does when he saw the delight on Rasulullah's face, he goes first to the house and he gets 1,000 gold coins, the dinar. And he comes and he gives them to Rasulullah's and he places and Rasulullah spread out his shirt and he places them in the shirt of Rasulullah. And Rasulullah he takes it and he shows the companions. He says, look. And he's doing this without any ego. You know, if man is doing this with no ego, that people should see what I'm doing. And this is when Rasulullah makes the statement that no matter what Uthman does after this, nothing can ruin anything of his now. And this statement of Rasulullah is enough for anyone who says, well, Uthman did this and he did this and he did this. Whether he did this or didn't do this, doesn't matter. Because Rasulullah says it doesn't matter what he does. Even though 99% of the things they accuse him of, he didn't do. But still doesn't matter. Whether he did it, didn't do it, the Rasulullah said, doesn't matter. You know, like when Hathim bin Baratha, when at the time of Fatih Makkah, when he sent the letter to, to Quraysh that Rasulullah is coming, and Rasulullah of course knew that he had done this and he captured him. He said, what have you done? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have not become a hypocrite. But I know that Allah will give you victory. And I only did this so that Quraysh would feel indebted to my family in Mecca and they won't harm them. And Umar Radiyah, of course wants to take his head off. And Rasulullah says, no, he is from the companions of Badr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said for the companions of Badr, it doesn't matter what they do from now on. Hmm? Now this is also an interesting point that if you look at the books of Hadith, whenever the Imams of Hadith, they mention a narration talking about something negative about a companion, they never mention the name of that companion. The companions are not masum. They are not innocent. They are mahfuz. They are protected. So when they did something, they always turn to repentance. The example, you know, the, the woman who committed zina, the companion, she committed zina. And I'm not going to go, go into the whole story, but when she came and she, she testified against herself four times, Rasulullah Sussan tells her go, when the baby is born, come back. The baby is born, she comes back. He says, now go and nurse him. And when after you nurse him, come back. And she goes and nurses him. And she says, now, you know, when, when find somebody to take care of him and then come back. He doesn't assign anybody. He doesn't take her name down. They'll keep a look eye on her that she doesn't run off. You know, you're talking two and a half years, roughly. At least two years after, you know, the incident. She keeps coming back. And when, she's, when they take her outside of, of Medina and she's being stoned, and some of her blood splashes on the, on the shirt of Khalid bin Walid, or then he says, oh, this, you know, the, the blood of this uh, adulteress has, has stained my clothes. And Rasulullah he says to him, he says, don't talk about her like this. <coughs> you know, I am the messenger of Allah, and I see her swimming in the rivers of paradise. And if her repentance were spread out throughout the people, all of the people of Medina Munawwara, they would all be forgiven. So again, when we're talking about the companions of Rasulullah, so we need to make sure that we bias ourselves correctly. So again, coming back, you know, Uthman, around the first six years, very smooth. Last six years is when the turmoil starts.
most many of the companions who were with Rasulullah from the beginning. By this time, they're either martyred, they passed away, they've been martyred, or now they're getting older. And now you have this new generation coming up who is eating the fruits of Islam without having sacrificed anything for those fruits. So they don't understand the value of it. And now these people are getting old enough to become in position to get into positions of leadership. Uthman, you know, when you're a leader, you have to have people that are at least loyal to you. Otherwise, you can't lead. You know, if everybody underneath you is not loyal, then what can you do? And he sees this situation, so he appoints various members of his family into certain positions. Because he figures that they will be loyal, out of blood, you know, not for anything else, at least out of blood, that they're loyal to him. He, every member of his family that he assigns to any position, and there were members of his family that had been assigned to positions before him that Omar had assigned. And a prime example of that is Mavia Radio in Sham. Mavia Radio was not assigned by Uthman. He was assigned as governor of Sham by Omar, by Omar Radio. The salaries of all of these people from his family, he paid out of his own pocket. So he didn't pay their salaries from Beit al you know, from the public treasury. They were paid from his own pocket. But he also paid them well. Because again, he's not paying them from the public treasury. He's paying them out of his own pocket. He can give them whatever he wants. Some of these family members, however, also caused issues. And then there were other people that were assigned that started causing issues. Of course, when you're the leader, and you have now hypocrisy is starting to stick its head out, and it's realizing that it's gaining footage. You know, if you look at the way Islam is attacked, you know, the outside forces, they really don't do a whole lot. At least not the open outside forces. What the outside forces do is they come and team up with somebody from the inside. And this is politics today. No nation has fallen just simply because somebody from the outside wanted them to fall. There's always been somebody from the inside who's betrayed them. And this is what's going on. You see, you have war politics today, same thing going on everywhere. You know, the, the reason that the West controls, you know, the Muslim world isn't because the West has such power. You know, it's because the people in the Muslim world have sold themselves. That's right. And so, What the hypocrites realize is that you know now they see these openings. During the Khilafah of Omar, they never found an opening. Mm -hmm. But now they start seeing these openings. Mm -hmm. So they see the openings and they start attacking. And again, you have a new generation. So if you look at the way the British came into the subcontinent, they came as traders, you know, East India Trade Company. But then, what did they do? You know, it wasn't that they attacked from the outside. They started buying scholars, giving them positions and giving them money. Yeah, you know, money. And one of the first things that they did was not a big thing. They had these scholars start. You know, talking, oh, you know, 
if you like, if you lay fatia, if you do prayer for somebody, if I give something in in so that somebody who's passed will be rewarded. Oh, this you know the only thing you can do is for yourself. You can't do anything for anybody else. And when they got a few people that were willing to latch on to this, now they realized, oh, this is a small thing. Now we can go to the bigger things. And so this is exactly what happens during the Khilafah of Uthman. If you start looking at the grievances that started coming against Uthman, you know, most of them again have no basis. Or rather the basis was not the reality. You know, they would pick something, twist it, and say, oh, see, this is what's going on. At this time also during the Khilafah of Uthman, if you look at the Khilafah of Umar, you, you've expanded, the Muslim, arm, Muslim Empire expands vastly. But you're still in, to te in areas where if Arabic isn't the primary language, it's at least a secondary language because of trade. Mm -hmm. Now during the Khilafah of Uthman, you have the Muslim world expanding into areas where Arabic really is not known. And when you get into like Azerbaijan and other areas which have occurred during the Khilafah of Uthman what did they start doing? They started taking the Quran and started writing it the way they saw fit. So Uthman orders, you know, when he, when he sees this happening, he orders that all of these writings that have taken place, everything will be brought in and everything was burned. And then he took the Quran that was compiled during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr. He had six copies made from that and then each one copy sent to each state. And he said that any other copy that will be made will be made based off of these. So they took this and said, oh, see Uthman, he burned the Quran. So see what he did? So this is what they did. And then they started going around and saying, oh, see, you know, the only heir to Rasulullah Sallallahu the only rightful heir to Rasulullah Sallallahu is Ali, because he's from his family. And no one else could be, you know, Khalifa other than Ali. So Uthman Radu needs to step aside and Ali Radu should be made the Khalifa. Of course, they didn't really want Ali Radu to be the Khalifa either. But this again, these are points that they bring to cause uh, unrest. You know, there's a whole list of grievances that they had. And they created a situation over time. You know, this didn't happen overnight. You know, they've been working underground for years and now this last six years, now they get, you know, a footing and now they're starting to spread all of these things. That by the end, they get the people in such an uproar that you have three massive groups, one from Kufa, one from Busra, and one from Egypt, mm -hmm. that come and lay siege to Medina Munawwara. Mm -hmm. And they come close to the time of Hajj. And they come and they lay, lay siege and cause an uproar to the extent that they said, you know, even surround the house of Uthman. You know, I've skipped over a lot of the grievances that they had, but you know, there are like 15 of them. And then there were 12 other points that they brought up, but those, you know, again, if you start analyzing each one, they really don't have any basis. But what they do is they come and they lay, lay siege. They create fear within the city of Rasulullah. <laughs> to the extent that people are, are afraid to go out of their houses. They surround the house of Uthman so that no one can get in or out. Uthman during this process, he calls Ali to the house. Ali Radhan still has, Ali is Ali. You know, who's going to mess with Ali? Unless he wants his head chopped off. 
So he asked Ali Radhan to come. And Ali Radhan comes and they talk and they discuss the situation. And then he asked Ali, he, you know, when these grievances come, he initially when the grievances started, before the siege is laid, Uthman Radhan sent various companions, including Ammar bin Yasser Radhan, to various parts of the, of the empire to go and investigate what's going on. Or these grievances, because they were saying that, you know, people in Egypt, you know, they're fed up with the governor that he's appointed there. And I'm not going to go into the details of who the governor was right now. Uh, I might do that next time. But, you know, so, so that they could investigate the situation and then come back and report to him. You have to understand, the propaganda was so strong that even some of the companions got wrapped up into it. Of course, they came out of it later, but initially got caught up in this. And so when the reports came back, there were conflicting reports, depending on where they were coming from as well. So eventually, Uthman, he asked Ali to go and talk to the people and see what they want, and we're willing to work with them. Because many of the companions had come to Uthman and said, look, uh, let's just put an end to this. You declare war and we will fight them and end everything. Uthman had the largest army of the world at that time. I mean, military, I mean, navy, largest navy. The strongest navy of the world at that time was in the Mediterranean, which was under the Muslim rule. This is how the Emirate of Cyprus and various other places were actually set up, was because of this navy. If he wanted to, he could have crushed everything. But he also understood that there were many people who were innocent who were caught up in this, and he did not want any innocent blood sp spilled for him for his own sake. He also understood that, and, and remember the saying of Rasulullah where he said that soon the swords will come out between two groups of Muslims and will not go back until the day of Bayarawa. And he did not want to be the cause of that. He did not want to be the one who triggered all of this. So he told them no. To the extent that he told them if anyone raises his sword on my behalf, I will, I will uh, complain against him on the day of judgment toward him. <coughs> and so Ali Radhan, he goes and he talks with, with the people. And they all, you know, it's like everything is decided and they agree that, you know, Uthman Radhan is going to replace the governor of, of Medina with the one that they wanted. They wanted Muhammad bin Abu Bakr Radhan as their governor. He says, fine, we'll, we'll make that change. We'll do all of these things. He agrees to them and they, all of these groups, you know, they say, oh, we're, so, we're satisfied and we're going back. The people of Medina Munawara felt everything was over, everything satisfied. You know, people, these, these you know, rioters and rebels, they're leaving. And it's just time for Hajj, so why don't we go for Hajj? So many of them set out for Hajj, including the wife of Rasulullah and Bibi Aisha Siddiqa, radiallahu anha. They leave for Hajj. These three, three groups that said, oh, we're all satisfied with everything that's been said, come back. suddenly come back, all at the same time which is interesting, and we'll go into what the excuse was for coming back next week, but it's interesting that you have three large groups going in different directions, one going north to Busra, one going uh, north uh, uh, west to Egypt, and the other northeast to Kufa. And they all come back at the same time, which also tells you that this was all pre-planned. So, you know, inshallah, I'll stop here today.
uh, will continue and actually for the next two months until Rabiul Awal comes. So this is Muharram and next month is Safar. So until Rabiul Awal comes, we'll be basically talking about this aspect of things. Uh, because it's going to take a while to go over things. Uh, and we'll see if I even complete it by then. Uh, but, uh, you know, inshallah, so we'll continue. But it's important to understand all of these points. That, and this is what also helps you understand various divisions within the Muslims today as well. Uh, but uh, you know, and it's also important to understand this because when you un when you look at what was going on there, it makes it very clear what's going on today as well. You know, the politics and all of the you know, um, all of the snakes that are laying out there. And it's, you know, it's sad to call these people snakes because maybe on the Day of Judgment, you know, the snakes will complain that you associated us with these things. You know, what can you call them? But Allah protect us from, from their fitna uh, and the fitna of the Dajjal, which is what we're living in today. Uh, and, you know, this will also help us understand the fitna of the Dajjal, uh, inshallah. Uh, may he fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions, and all of those who they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah, go and make sunnah, inshallah.